In this series, I'm going to make portraits to reveal some truths about who we are. In the work I make and the way I live my life, I'm interested in identity, in what's behind the masks we wear. Ready? Yeah. And I'll try and capture the real Ryland. <laughs> God forbid. Portraits are some of the greatest art in history, and they're a scary challenge for an artist. You're part psychologist and part detective. You hunt for clues to the inner life. Then everything you've seen, you distill, and one single image is all you get. But get it right, and that image tells you something a thousand selfies never could. Our most beautiful and complex artwork that we can make is our identity. When they're finished, I'll be allowed to place my portraits in the Holy Temple of British Portraiture, the National Portrait Gallery in London. But the people I've chosen aren't these polished heroes of British history. Most of the people in this gallery are white, middle-aged, heterosexual, as far as we know, men. And uh, I'm doing something, I suppose, quite cheeky. There's me, the oik with a bit of a chip on his shoulder, bringing a parade of the unusual and the troubled in amongst these seemingly impervious icons of British solidity. My portrait subjects are people who are experiencing some of the extremes of modern life. They're at a crossroads or a crisis in their identity. I've chosen them because I think they'll help us all to answer what might be the oldest question ever posed. In this programme, I'm going to tackle some of the big themes of individual identity today. I'm looking at gender, at fame, and at religion. But for my first individual portrait, I picked a white, middle-aged, middle-class man facing a drastic collapse in the power and status he'd enjoyed. Just before I met the former cabinet minister, Chris Hewn, he had been found guilty of perverting the course of justice for getting his ex-wife to take the points he'd got when caning it down the M11 in a BMW with personalised plates. Okay, upstairs. The work of making portraits begins long before I put pen to paper. I need to understand not so much what my subjects look like, but who they think they are. So if this was Chris Hoon, if I opened him up, you know, who, who's the next layer in, do you think? Uh, well, it, I don't know what the next layer is, because actually people are not like Russian dolls. They are they? at the moment. Just yeah. At this precise moment, they're exactly <laughs> like I don't know what the next layer is. We're dealing with Chris, who's still got the skills that he's learned in, uh, after 13 years in Parliament. Well, if you learn much in the way of skills, 13 years in Parliament, I'm a great believer in learning other ones. But, uh, Woodwork, yeah. mailbag sewing. <laughs> Chris had invited me round the night before he found out whether he was going to jail for what he'd done. I was hoping this kitchen supper would be the beginning of a revealing identity journey, from high status, alpha male, to potentially more vulnerable man. What I'm really interested in is the phenomena of the powerful man. You would represent that kind of powerful white male. I don't think I'm a typical stereotype. All you're trying to say is that the man is, a, is, is the product of some experiences that you're interested in, which is the white middle-class middle-aged guy rather than yes. these other experiences. But that's true. Which aren't you... typical of white middle-aged middle class. That's true. Men. That's and why you know, I just blank those out. We were joined for tuna steaks by Chris's girlfriend and former press officer Karina. So what are you drinking to tonight? Uh, freedom. The future. <laughs> <For> freedom. <laughs> yeah. Last few days, last supper.
Yeah. Well, it's been a very long process. My, my QC actually described that uh, who, who had a good Catholic education um, said that it was um, that, that his vision of me was Saint Sebastian being uh, having all these all these arrows coming in from all directions, uh, which is some, sometimes what it's felt like over the last few months. But you know, Saint Sebastian didn't necessarily bring it on himself quite. Well, quite we don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> he might have. I want to ask Karina actually. Do you think Chris is? Being bulletproof, do you think he's being him? He, he is genuinely not not worried about going to prison. I think he is quite bulletproof. He's very philosophical about it. But at the end of the day, um, I think he's slightly scared about it. Do you think it's changed him this experience? Mm -hmm. Not particularly. But if Chris saw himself as a modern day Saint Sebastian. What I was noticing was how the arrows kept bouncing off. The next morning, as he finally faced the music, I realised that my portrait would need to reflect this seeming invincibility. Chris did indeed receive a prison sentence for his crime. I want to make a true portrait about his true situation. And so at the moment, it's about this kind of bulletproof mask that stands up in public and nothing sticks to it. And I'm kind of going, no, you're a man who's had everything and you've been in the cabinet and now you're a prisoner. And in everybody else's eyes, it's a disaster. Yet in yours, it's like, oh, well, never mind, career number four, move on. And I'm kind of like, mm. It will be three months until I saw Chris again. While he spent time at Her Majesty's pleasure, I spent time on the slippery lower slopes of celebrity culture. Portraits have always celebrated the famous, but I wanted for my subject someone who is experiencing fame in its most extreme modern manifestation. So I picked the X Factor contestant and celebrity Big Brother winner, Rylan Clark. Here we are on the set of uh, Big Brother's Bit on the Side, which is uh, hosted by Rylan. This is the, the kind of fountainhead of this kind of very modern sort of celebrity, the kind of paper-thin, famous-for-being-famous sort of celebrity. If you like David Attenborough looking in at the gorillas. Rylan lives at his mum's house in Stanford La Hope, Essex and spends what little downtime he has obsessively critiquing his own performances. And I look at like things like this now and I sit there and think like, I've changed myself so much, so much to, a, to an extent where if I wanted to go back to normal, I probably couldn't now. So I still feel like I have to keep building. I don't think I'll ever be happy because I know it's all fake. It's all fake. But that you're, you're sat here next to me, you're, you know, you're a real person. You're Rylan. But I'm not really Rylan, am I? Like, you've got your alter ego. Yeah. Rylan's my one. I'm like, I'm little Ross from Stepney Green, really. What would happen if sort of Ross got up on the stage then? Oh, I'd shit myself. I couldn't do it. And the shit that I get on Twitter, like, I hope you get cancer and die. I hope your mum dies. I hope you fucking get knocked out. I'd love to slit, sl slit your throat and shit like that. I wouldn't leave my house. But they're not talking to Ross, they're talking to Rylan. So that's all right. Rylan can take it. That's his job. <laughs> <laughs> The more time I spent with Rylan, the more I saw that his celebrity lifestyle wasn't the problem. That was the part he really liked. How many Twitter followers have you got? Nearly a million now. Wow, nice. That's power. It's crazy. What troubled him was how easily his fake identity was being believed. And in that, he struck me not as peculiar, but as strangely universal. 
often when I'm thinking about, you know, the psychological states of uh, the modern world, I think of we haven't evolved for 30,000 years since we all lived in small villages of maybe 100 or 150 people in the middle of the forest. And in a village like that, we would have all been a celebrity. Everybody would have known that, you know, Ugg would have been good at hunting and Og would have been good at thatching roofs or something. And so everybody within the village was known and felt seen. Yet now we live in a very fast-moving, anonymous world, and so we never have ourselves constantly reflected back at us in a stable, satisfying way. And then the idea of celebrity is presented to us, where we imagine that when we look into the camera, we will feel the world va validating ourselves. It's almost like we're seeing the condition of being an individual, of having an identity on steroids, sort of heightened through the lens. I ask all of my subjects to sit for preliminary sketches for their portrait. By the time Ryland sat for his, I'd given up on trying to nail the inner him. Ryland's depths were the least intriguing thing about him. Capturing his crafted surface was where the artistic challenge lay. When you basically sculpt yourself continuously, mm. that is inside and out, for how other people see you, yeah. what happens to the to the you that you that is perhaps being made all the time just for yourself? You just you don't. I haven't really got a choice. No, I just but carry on. Don't you worry about it disappearing entirely? until there's only, all you have is a relationship with people, not with yourself. I don't think if we didn't have people judging us and stuff like that, we wouldn't know what our identity was. Ryland struck me as a digital creation for the modern media age, and I had an idea of how my portrait might reflect that. It was to come from the earliest beginnings of portraiture in British art. The project of making portraits of modern individuals was off to a bumpy start. If I had made progress on my study of a personality sculpted by fame, I was struggling with my portrait of power. And for a third portrait subject to face off against the grandees of a national portrait gallery, I went in search of an identity being radically transformed by religion. I was very racist. I didn't like Muslims. That probably started about about 15. I got into drinking. Taking the mick out of people. Just being horrible. More than 5,000 Britons a year convert to Islam, and the most typical convert is a 27-year-old white woman. It struck me as another very modern identity journey to try to capture in a portrait. And at the mosque in Ashford, Kent, I found Kaylee, an unemployed, 27-year-old, single mother of four. So you were quite wild. Very wild, very wild child. I'm ashamed of what I did before, but then I'm grateful for what I've been through because it's made me a better person today. With Allah, he knows everything. You know, and there's a reason why he doesn't want you to do certain things. When mum said, don't do that, she'd be like, she is, oh, why, why shouldn't I do that? Because I said, I'm your mum. But if one of my children come to me and say, can I do this? And I'm like, no. And they're like, why? Because there's a reason why Allah doesn't want you to do that. So if you say to Latisha she can't do something because I'm Allah, hoping Allah... she will go, OK, mum might not know but I can't hide it from Allah, I can't. He's, he sees and hears everything. He knows everything. So, Letitia... Does Allah know everything? Does he yeah. see everything? Yeah. Does he hear everything? Yeah. Even if you don't talk and you yeah. say something in your head? Yeah. He can still hear you, yeah. Islam offered Kaylee order, 
But her brother Ryan saw things very differently. What were your feelings when she first told you that she was going to convert to Islam? Um, without sounding like horrible, maybe a little bit ashamed. You must be seeing that it's doing good things for Kaylee. Yeah. Do you think I've changed yeah. for the yeah. better? Yeah, a hell of a lot. You have changed for the better. Yeah, you could have done all of this without turning into a Muslim. You could have done this no, as an English woman. I, I, I believe Muslim yeah. Islam has made me better. Not mm -hmm. I've made yeah, myself yeah. better. OK, I see it from your point of view. But that's so not if my I didn't view, have Muslim and Islam in my life and all the sisters in my life and that support in my life, I don't think I would have changed. OK, but why not Christianity? I don't, because why, I, don't be I don't believe the Bible. Why, yeah, why do you believe the Quran then? Because... It's both, to, to me, they're both books. So why have you chosen they're Muslim They're not just books. The, the Bible's been changed a few times and obviously that's going to contradict a lot of people that are Christian, but it has changed. The Quran is still the same from the first day it was written. OK, so because it's, it's never... not changed, that's yeah, the religion. So you basically yeah. chose a religion off of the books not being changed? Yes. I'm not going to live my life out of a book. I will, I will live my life free and happy and not when I'm laying on my deathbed. But I'm free. Look. Yes, I know. And I'm happy. To you. But listen, you can't eat pork, yeah? Yeah. All right? You can't drink. Yeah. Yeah, you can't smoke. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to have kids after marriage and everything like that, yeah? Yeah. I don't have to do none of that. I can go out and I can get drunk with the lads and I can wake okay, up the next morning and think that was a quality night. But I can with a wake up, head. I can wake up the next morning and go and have a nice bacon sandwich because I enjoy bacon, yeah? Mm. I can then, the next day, I could get somebody pregnant and I can love them, but I haven't got the money to have a marriage. I wouldn't want to get pregnant by somebody that's going to leave me. Yeah, but marriage, marriage, marriage isn't going to keep two people together. But if you've got the both of the love for Allah, then the both of the love for Allah will bring you closer together. Yeah, but is a religion strong enough to keep marriage when everything else yes. is falling apart? Yes. Do you watch EastEnders? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Ryan had put his finger on the identity conflict Kaylee was facing, but I wasn't sure he'd really grasped what it was that Islam was offering her. If I didn't have Islam in my life now, I think I'd be in a very awkward place. Well, before, my kids would always be like, oh, my friends have got this and I want that and I want what my friends have got. Now my kids, they understand more. They don't need that stuff where they're going to a better place. They don't need 20 pairs of shoes. I was very much the same. I used to have hundreds of shoes. Now I'm just like, I don't need it. Do you feel calmer? Yeah. It was this conversation about trainers that clinched Kaylee's portrait. It would be about a clash of civilizations. But it wasn't Islam versus Christianity, it was Islam versus shopping. And Ashford gave me the perfect set of visual metaphors I was looking for. When I went with Kaylee to her mosque, which is that converted pub, ironically, over there, I was sort of immediately kind of excited with the idea of its proximity to another great sort of temple of Western consumerism on the other side of the motorway, which is the Ashford Designer Outlet Centre, which is a curiously Bedouin-esque design. So immediately I was sort of drawn to this idea of this alternative mecca. The rest of Kaylee's generation and the young people of, of Britain often are buying their identity from the big brand shops just on that side of the motorway. And Kaylee has opted for another identity, which is offered by the mosque and Islam. And I think here, this, this tiny bit of England sort of encapsulates that journey all here, either side of a windswept motorway in Kent. And once I saw Kaylee's story in those terms, it came to me in a flash what form this portrait should take. A hijab. The centre of attention in this country, often, about women in Islam is the headscarf. So I thought, it, for me, it was a no-brainer. Why not do a hijab as the object that I'm going to make? And a hijab that tells the story of Kaylee and her conversion to Islam. And, and I think the, the sort of revelatory inspirational moment for me 
was when we went to visit uh, the mosque and the fact that it was just over the other side of a dual carriageway from Ashford Outlet Centre, there was something poetically just right about that. There, there is something very universal about Kaylee's story in that, you know, when we're all trying to find our identity, find ourselves, say, um, we're offered a lot of off-the-shelf options. And of course, you know, the, the two sides of this artwork represent in many ways two versions of it. You know, you have the, the kind of Western capitalist model of buy your identity at Ashford Outlet Centre. And then you have the kind of, you know, just as rigid, just as uh, off the shelf version that religion offers. Um, I'm not saying that one is any better than the other. It's just that in some ways they both offer a refuge for the person whose identity is at sea. Making the Ashford hijab would be a breeze from now on, with my Photoshop design being printed on silk. But the hard part was about to begin. Chris Hoon was coming out of jail. I was working on my portraits for the National Portrait Gallery and I'd been struggling with how to penetrate the inner truth of Chris Hume. So we arranged to meet on the morning of his release from prison in a truck stop cafe off the M4. How did you find prison life? I get used to it. I didn't feel in any way threatened at any point during it. Um, although there are a lot of very sad and very distressed people in prison, and a lot of people who shouldn't be in prison, in my view. I'm probably the only politician who's been in prison whose views about prison have not changed. Um, <laughs> so you're out of prison now about an hour, and you're already a politician. What do you think you've learned from two and a half months in prison? Well, one thing I think I'm... About pretty, yourself. What, what, oh, I don't know, about myself. Well, yeah. Don't you learn things about yourself from what you learn about other people? Um, if you could put it in terms of what you've learned about yourself, yeah. Well, I think one of the things that, which I don't think was a terrible surprise, but a lot of people inside are ordinary folk. Who, like you? Well, yeah. Ordinary folk that have done something wrong. For people reading, you know, and looking at the TV and reading about you, that your main crime is a kind of sense of entitlement, though. Well, that's your view. It's, I'm not alone like that, though. I mean, from the outside, it looks like you are not contrite and that you are not kind of remorseful about these things you know, because you are not demon demonstrably upset by it. So, therefore, in PR terms, your, your, your kind of you know, very useful attitude to life can be a little bit of a problem. Well, maybe. Um, that's, that's, part, that's my character, I'm afraid. <laughs> I, don't think, I mean, you know, uh, people have to take you to leave it. But uh, <laughs> I, I don't think you can be prosecuted for being optimistic and forward-looking. Oh, I, I, think... I, I think there's some people out there now who'd love to prosecute you for being optimistic, <laughs> especially in a built-up area. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose I expected to see some sort of change in Chris, having been inside for two and a half months and had time to reflect. I don't feel that I'm getting, I suppose, a more vulnerable Chris Hume. And I, I don't know if there is one. In many ways, it confirms my suspicion about him as a prime example of the white, male, middle-class, middle-aged power elite. God, I haven't sat for a portrait since I was about 18. <laughs> well, I think you're the first one of the people I've been drawing who's ever sat for one before. So if you were in Africa, you were going into a school, um, and you were going to describe your tribe to them, <laughs> how would you go about it? That's a rather good. That's a rather, I'm not an anthropologist. Yeah, but say so you, you have a pun. You know, if you were, you were there, you've, you've been put on the spot, you know, you're a visiting dignitary or whatever. I think I'd need a bit of time for preparation on that. Oh, so. Just no turn, off the, need turn off the politician. I need notice well, of the crowd. Turn, turn off the politician and try and be vulnerable for a second. <laughs> <laughs>
What was I reading? Like? Imagine what it's what like to I be reading? slightly vulnerable, I Chris. I know it's I hard saw, for you to grow up. To I grow saw up. that. I saw that interview, Grayson, where you were saying, "Oh yeah, that Christine's going to be a difficult nut to crack." Depends what you want out of the nut, doesn't it? I think I'm. I think I'm. I'm a. I'm a, already a half open pistachio. Dear. I think they're for the taking. Pistachio, not a common old garden KP then. Uh, maybe I'm a sort of chippy working class pro, you know, that's going to come in here and. Chippy working class pro with a CBE and a. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, um, have you got your tag on? Yeah. Can I have a look? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why don't you want to show it? It's the Hackney Rolex. Why don't you want to show it? <laughs> well, I don't think, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's... Why should you be part of society's ritual humiliation? Well, that's... Why do you want to be part of society's ritual humiliation? It's the, that's quite, I mean, I think that's, that's the, the first time you've shown any kind of vulnerability. Really. I think that is the least attractive part of this whole process. And I hope you stand duly admonished for asking me to sh show you my tag. That's what it is. <laughs> it's nice the way you've managed to get a, a, weave a whole sort of political point around it, you know. Chris doesn't think he has an identity, but the more he asserted his unique individuality, the more familiar the pattern seemed to me. And if I was going to make a portrait which expressed that feeling of predictable repetition, there was only one artist to reference. Andy Warhol. It had to be almost like called Andy Warhol. It had to be a repeat. The boldest motif I've got here is his personalised number plate, H11HNE. There's something about that that sort of encapsulates the whole hewn hubris. If we follow the story down, we've got here is a willy, because that, you know, that's what kind of got him into trouble at the next stage, really, was putting this where it shouldn't have been. But I like the idea of it being a kind of repeat pattern because it's sort of almost implicit in this is, will they ever learn? Because the one thing that perhaps would endear him more to the public would be vulnerability. For this work, just glazing the pot wasn't enough. I wanted to express my feelings about the way Chris had been presenting and that meant one more transformation I had to make. What symbolises vulnerability in many ways better than a pot? If Chris wouldn't show any cracks in his persona, my portrait certainly would. I'd been making portraits about power, about fame and about religion. And for my final individual portrait, I went to Bromley, where I met a subject to help me tackle the identity issue most personal to me. In this modern, metrosexual society we all live in, we have this idea that we're a great sort of spectrum of gender there. Everybody's terribly accepting of it. But of course, if you look at the advertising that bombards us daily, it, more than ever in some ways, it wants that easy binary of the very feminine woman with long flowing hair and legs and high heels and the tough man with his six pack and his adventures and his camouflage clothes. We are in many ways very accepting of difference, but at the same time there is a great pressure on society to sell us, literally, the idea of either being totally male or totally female. Trainee marketing assistant Jazz was born a girl, but is taking male hormones and embarking on a life as a man. I was about four, yeah. and at that age I didn't really know there was a difference between boys and girls really, but I felt like I was one of the boys, and I had a um, fascination with Peter Pan, and I had this costume I always wore, and like I was just a boy. 
but I didn't know that no one saw me that way. But I remember my mum trying to put me in a dress and I was crying like a lot to the point where I was going to be sick. How is your identity sitting with you now? It's still really scary. Um, as I think it's because I'd kept it inside so long and now everything's just really out. Peter Pan, a slippery figure of indeterminate gender and a resonant image in art. This portrait was beginning to speak powerfully from a place I could really relate to. Ugh. What do you think your experience has taught you about how we all construct our identities, particularly our gender identities? Because they've not had to, probably had to think about it to the extent that someone like me, or maybe even you, had thought about it. Um, most people go along with what they're told growing up, what's acceptable, what it means to be a man or a woman, who said that because you're female, you have to do that. And most people don't really have an answer for it. They just kind of like, well, that's just how it is. And it's, it's just what well, someone told me and that's it. Yeah, I sometimes think some of the most dangerous words are normal and natural. Yeah. But was Jazz right when he insisted that his struggle with his gender was just an extreme version of an identity journey we all have to make? We went back to his old school to find out. I used to go here, so I just wanted to come and talk to everyone about gender identity and what you guys think when you think of gender. Like, how would you describe it? I don't think it's as bad for um, women to be playing with action, like action men or anything, but I think if a boy was to go play with Barbie, I think that it would be like a really big thing because like, women are encouraged like, to be independent and like, to try and like, live up to what a male could do. I remember the year 11 prom, like nobody told me that I had to wear a dress, but all the other girls were wearing dresses. So I was like, I have to wear a dress, even, even though I felt so awkward and I really couldn't walk in heels and I would have been <laughs> much more comfortable wearing like <laughs> trousers, bow tie or something like that. <laughs> so that's actually why I skipped all of that stuff yeah. because for me I was thinking well just because of the body I have I would have had to conform to all that and it would have made the whole night miserable for me. Like what am I going to bring a male date just so I look the part, do you know what I mean? There's loads of boys like going out having sex yeah and they're bragging about it to me and everything yeah and I'm just sitting there like I haven't had sex and stuff so like I'm a bit pressured to like have sex, but I don't want to because I feel as a per as my person, I don't need to have sex yet to for other people to accept me as a boy. It's, it's seen as not being a good thing as you're not a man. I see like like my friends and like even my family, my mum and like everyone like makeup, wearing hair, and then nails done, and like I feel like at some point I will just like well if everyone else is doing it, then am I weird for not? being that way. So then like a couple of years ago, I was just like, wear more makeup, I've got my nails done, I'm wearing makeup now. I succumb to pressures, become part of me now. I mean, Jez, I want to ask you, do you feel, you know, that you're someone who is becoming a man? Do you feel that you're, there's a kind of pressure on you that you think you have to maybe make sure of it by becoming a real hench kind of guy? <laughs> I think I don't even want to be hench. That's the thing. <laughs> but it's really weird, like, in the beginning, when I first started transitioning, I did feel like a lot of pressure to be far more masculine than I naturally am. Because suddenly people were picking out stupid things, like my cousin said, that the way I butter bread is really feminine. <laughs> I was just like, how do you butter bread like a woman? Do you know what I mean? Like, well, I don't even know what that means. But I find that people really nitpick with me and they try to point out things about me and say they're feminine when I don't even know how they could be feminine in the first place. The students were picking up on Jazz's hard-won wisdom and it was bringing something home to me as well. His transition wasn't a series of surgical procedures. He was merely trying to build an identity he no longer had to justify every day. The next decisive step he had to take was to justify that identity to his mum, Hazel. I suppose you, you have a girl, and in my mind I had a vision for her. Mm. So I was a bit disappointed. I mean, you say you still call Jazz she. She. Do you think you'll ever be able to call her, her he? I, I don't think so. After 24 years of she, I think it's, it just comes naturally out of my mouth without even thinking. Yeah. I'd come back to Bromley for Jazz's 24th birthday. His family had gathered for his party. 
I knew he'd decided to tell them all how he felt growing up by reading them a poem he'd been writing. I wrote a poem about my feelings in this whole transition. It's what's on the inside that counts, or so I'd like to believe. My content's overlooked and my page is disregarded. Told my identity lies between my legs and not where my heart is. But things are not always what they seem. Eyes lie sometimes, mirrors do deceive. And the shell does not accurately show what's inside of me. I've been living in a cage and I want to be free. I've cried, I've screamed, I've suffered, but I've grown. And you may say that you're hurt and you wish that you'd known. But while you were busy living life, I was right here, dealing alone. Yeah, it's just, you're just feeling your pain, that's all. Yeah. Yeah. Is it hard to hear it like that? In... Jazz is good at putting things down on paper. And what she said there, I got it, but then it just hit a nerve today. What I like about it is that I think we need to formalise things sometimes, you know, because we can go through situations that are ambiguous and, and difficult to kind of... And if somebody says, you know, it's like a wedding, you know, it's like we say, this is happening and this is now, and from now on things will be different. And you all understand where we are. And that's why we have those rituals. In a way, it was a, it was a ritual. It's a ritual. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And it might be difficult to hear, but I think that... I, I, you know, I, I think it's a good thing. I just felt the pain, that's all. Yeah. I'm a mum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jazz was assuming the mantle of manhood, one small but heroic step at a time. After hearing his poem at the party, I wanted my portrait to help him on his way. And for a heroic portrait, nothing quite cuts it like a statue. Now I knew exactly the kind of sculpture I had to make. I really love Benin bronzes from West Africa. They're incredibly sort of dignified and powerful. This is uh, jazz as a kind of Benin style Peter Pan. You know, somewhere in our childhood kind of uh, sensitivity, we have an amazing kind of ability to seek out the symbols um, that kind of nurture our self-image. That's what I found very moving about it really, was that you're kind of scanning the cultural landscape for symbols that somehow exhibit traits that you can't even articulate to yourself. It's a declaration. He's standing on this podium declaring his manhood at the end of the transformation, perhaps, almost looking forward to the moment when Jazz, you know, can, can take his top off. <laughs> the opening of my exhibition at the National Portrait Gallery was fast approaching. At the foundry, my Benin-style Peter Pan transgender jazz was being cast in brass. For the Hoon vase, my plan was taking shape. I wanted the pot to be put back together, but in a way that showed the vulnerability Chris wouldn't. An expert restorer was using an ancient Chinese technique to trace the cracks in gold. But I still had one last portrait to make reality TV star, Rylan. I found an artistic precedent for what I wanted to capture about him in the court portraiture of the Elizabethan age. Thinking about Rylan, I went back to kind of the original portrayal of celebrities um, in some ways, which was the sort of Elizabethan miniature. You know, he looks like one of these guys, like he could be a contemporary Earl of Essex in a kind of digital age. I thought there was interesting parallels between um, 
the miniature, the little portrait that you hold in your hand or have against your breast, and the iPhone, which of course is a big tool in the kind of uh, manufacture of celebrities like Rylan. Rylan, he seems uh, unapologetic almost about uh, forming himself into a popular figure. It's a phenomenon that's happening to a lot of people because they have everybody now flirts with celebrity in some kind of way through the internet. And, you know, they've got their Facebook page and they, and they have a version of themselves they want to put out there that isn't necessarily completely uh, overlapping with what they see as their real self. Now I had to show my portraits to the subjects themselves and they still had no idea what kind of work I'd made. What is particularly anxiety-making for me about the moment of showing these people their portraits is that it is just me, the artist, them, the individual. And whatever I've done, they're going to take it personally. In the 18 months since I first met my subjects, Ryland's presenting career has taken off, and he has just got engaged to Dan, a former Big Brother contestant. <laughs> Hello! <laughs> this is the most nerve-wracking thing I've ever done. Oh, my God, no! <laughs> oh, my God! <laughs> it's called the Earl of Essex. The Earl of Essex! <laughs> Do you know what I get from that? I remember you said something to me about I sort of play a caricature of myself, and that is exactly what that is, isn't it? Well, I thought that also there's sort of a, a bit of an irony in that, you know, the biggest character we're dealing with has got the smallest portrait, you know. But that's why I like it. You literally just stand in this room and you, do, you are drawn to that, even though it's, it's the smallest thing in this room. You're just like, oh, this is a nice one. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> Fuck Ryland, you... dude, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to do with the fact that she's doing? <laughs> oh, it's just so... I love it. Yeah? I absolutely love it. Get him. Yeah. Oh my god, this is like <laughs> amazing. The inspiration for the Ashford hijab, Kaylee, has married and had a fifth child. Hello. I have no words. It's everything look mecca. Well. Wow. You know what it is? It's a hijab. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, wow, yeah. It's on silk. Oh, wow. And you've got it from my past to now. From then to then. Yeah, you got it. Even though it's my life, it doesn't seem like it's my life anymore. Do you feel like you've come a long way in yeah, those 18 months? What's definitely. changed for you? Just more peaceful, more, more sure of where I am, more of who I am. And that's it. Bye-bye, past. Hello, future. If I could pick you up and chuck you around, <laughs> I definitely would. Jazz has changed his name to Alexander and had top surgery. <laughs> I did not expect that. <laughs> <laughs> what were you expecting? I have no idea. <laughs> oh, I see where you got Peter Pan in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of made me look heroic. <laughs> well, I think there is something heroic about what you're doing. It's a sort of heroic statue of identity declaration. I feel like it shows a lot of what I've actually been through this, since I last saw you. I feel even more like me than I, than I did back then. I feel like I can stand up straight now. So this is actually really, really accurate. It really shows my journey in this past couple of years. I'm so touched. That's so great. Thank you. <laughs> Here you are 
in this room with characters of the 19th yeah. century. The one uh, soldiers. And all those kind of, all those sort of uh, vibe of colonialism in here, you know, so it's sort of like Britain itself has come a long way that we can celebrate someone like you in here. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. I'm very proud. Yeah, I'm proud. <laughs> And Chris, the sitter I was most apprehensive about showing to, now has a column in The Guardian and a management role at a green energy company. I'm not looking forward to this, no. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Grayson. Hi. How are you doing? What's this? Was it the pot? Yes, this Fantastic. is my portrait of you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. That's absolutely brilliant. That's exactly what I wanted. Really? Yeah, I always oh, said I wanted good. you to do a pot. <laughs> what have you got here? You're, what, what's, what about the gold? What's all that about? Uh, it's about vulnerability. I was very interested that the actual, what the thing was, was also saying something about you. Right. Because, you know, the, the stereotype that I hold so dear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And I like, the, I like the sort of phallic symbols around me. I assume that's what it is. Yes, it is. Of course it is. <laughs> And you're here, Chris. Here you oh, are, look. Lovely. Yeah. In the, in the great hall of the, 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 the great and the good of British politics, and here you are. And the nexus of, of the establishment. <laughs> no, 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 you're the establishment. <laughs> You've got to get this right. You're the establishment. So, let's see if we can oh, do well, a self. Let's both do one here. We're going to do right. this. Is, this is self portraiture at its most modern look. Hang on. Here you go. <laughs> Groovy. Our identity is something we perform over a lifetime. So this idea that we are this static thing, I think, is an illusion. We are a series of bits of baggage, but eventually they build up into this ongoing, lifelong artwork that is our individual identity. I and mean, we feel it, and we live it, and we perform it. <laughs> <laughs> 